Hi, Dr. Wall. I'm going to call you Alessandra. Hope that's okay. Welcome mm-hmm. to welcome to Speak as a Leader podcast. Thank you so much for being here. It's such a thrill talking to you, and I am looking forward to this conversation. Well, I'm very excited about the conversation, too, clearly, since I butted in in mid-sentence, <laughs> and Alessandra is just fine. Awesome. So you were a licensed clinical psychologist for many years. Then you took a deep dive into the education sector, and now you work in women in leadership. And you're also on the board and, uh, for a number of women in leadership programs, and you lead your own women in leadership work. So I want to know a little bit about your journey, what got you here, what got you started, and then what got you here. Sure. Okay, so as you uh, stated, I started my professional life off as a clinical psychologist. I am technically still a licensed clinical psychologist, although I do not practice anymore. And uh, what led me there was what leads all psychologists to where they go, which is, you know, just trying to fix fix all the past. I mean, really, honestly, if you talk to most psychologists, they have a story for why they became a therapist. Um, and, you know, Personally, I really believed that it was a job that would sustain me my whole life, meaning it would be interesting and challenging and exciting, which are all things I need in order to be good at what I do. And then somewhere in my mid-30s, I didn't want to do it anymore, which was terrifying. And I know I'm not alone. Lots of people face that. We say what that most people cycle through four different, four to seven different careers in their lifespan. Um, But I never considered anything else. Uh, And uh, so then I did what everybody does, which is I became a life coach because everyone and their mother at least dips a toe in into life coach dumb when you're trying to figure out your own life. And uh, I learned a lot about business. I learned a lot about what not to do in business, uh, how to fail at business. It was very useful. Um, I'm very grateful for all the time I spent. And I built a business that essentially I hated. Uh, And I built a business that essentially was a financial failure. And I burnt myself out doing it, which I think is also very typical of a lot of people. It might not be building a business. It's working towards a career where you start off and you're like, I think I want that thing. And then you just single-mindedly head towards it and exhaust yourself just to realize that it's not what you wanted. And I'm extremely fortunate because then for the second time in my career and in my life, I was able to take a pause and to really consider what I want. And then that brings us to what I'm doing now. And now what I have is an executive coaching practice here. I'm based out of uh, California, San Diego, California. And um, I work very specifically with women and very specifically with women in STEM and finance. Uh, And I work with the companies who hire these women. My goal is to uh, support women in senior leadership and executive leadership so that they can move all the way to the top and they can A, succeed, B, do things differently and C, change the system from within. That's amazing. I love that you've had this rich journey, this rich personal and professional journey where you've taken different pivots and taken different pauses throughout the course of of your life so far and found different things that interest you and excite you. It's personally very interesting for me to hear because I think I've had quite a lot of parallels. I have also pivoted twice, once in my late 20s and once in my late 30s, which is actually very recently. And I also pretty much made the same mistakes. So maybe it's it's one of those things like women in their early 30s seem to go for things that they think they want, but they don't really know what they want. I don't know, it's just a guess, but that's exactly what happened to me. We evolve, right? Like there are so many fallacies um, that we're fed when we're children. Like the idea that you should know what you want to be when you're a kid. I cannot, I have two children. I have two boys, 11 and 13. And I cannot stand the fact that they have been asked since they were little boys, what they want to be when they grow up. How are they supposed to know? And even now when they speak, they're like, Oh, I'm going to go to med. I'm like, you're 13. Do not talk to me about going to medical school. You have no idea what you want to do. How about we finish what's called middle school here. And then, 
finish high school and then go to college and then you'll have your first job, whatever your first career is. Um, so that's one fallacy, but growing up as an adult with that, and by the way, side, I think that's changing, but as a Gen Xer, which is firmly what I am, that is the, that is what we were fed. Uh, you get to a point where there's this massive disconnect between who you are and what you've been pursuing. And the millennial generation was the first generation to introduce the concept of quarter life crisis. And I love them for it. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I so I'm, I'm like one of the oldest millennials. Um, I don't think we're that far, far apart in age. So and I had a late quarter life crisis. And that was the turning point of my life. And it's weird, because even the the meaning of that term has changed since I had it. Because at that time, I didn't describe it as a quarter life crisis. It wasn't a cool thing to do. This was, mm -hmm. you know, the early 2000s. I described this period as my uh, fondly as my late quarter life crisis and people laugh and they understand what I'm saying. And I used to describe it as a quarter life crisis, maybe even up to seven or eight years ago. And people would feel sorry for me and say, no, you didn't have a crisis, did you? So I get I get what you mean, that maybe a quarter life crisis is actually just a rite of passage for everyone. Yeah. I mean, we know it happens for midlife crises, right? The midlife crisis does not need to mean you go out and have an affair or buy a red car or do something <laughs> wild and crazy. Really what it, what it speaks to is mm. you know, historically this massive disconnect, especially when we lived in the, oops, sorry, especially when we lived in, in the, you know, work 50 years at the same company, do the same thing, retire with a gold watch just this huge disconnect between who we were evolving to be. I mean, think about, I always think about this. The woman I was at 21 when I graduated college and the woman I was at 26 when I graduated graduate school were fundamentally different people and very different from the woman I was at um, 35, who is somewhat different from the woman I am now. And in 10 years, I will have evolved. So to think that the same occupation, interests are going to keep me motivated is it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, very true. And yeah, evolving, evolving in your own personality, interests, value systems, beliefs is a natural process. And if you haven't evolved, then that's, that's probably a problem of some sort. But that's, I would still say in a lot of parts of the world, especially Asia, unfortunately, that is still a very progressive view of things and people are not there yet. And they think that actually being loyal to the same set of values and principles that you received as a kid is what life is all about, is what creating a strong society or community system is all about. And I'm definitely not part of that school of thought but it's hard to fight that when everyone around you thinks the same. There's certainly a cult, there's certainly a cultural aspect to it, and then there's a privilege aspect to it, right? So the cultural aspect is undeniable since this is not something that people were dealing with 50 years ago, right? There's a cultural shift, at least in, in the Western world, that occurred with the advent of the millennial generation that really propelled this idea that we don't need to wait for the midlife crisis and actually the, if you're ever interested the midlife crisis is a biological like when you look at all populations in the world regardless of whether they're employed or not regardless of whether they are there is this point of misery that occurs in your late 40s through towards your early 50s and then happiness goes back up again regardless of whether people work regardless it is just this universal pattern that I think really coincides with that midlife crisis, that existential, who am I? What is my life amounted to? Is this what I want? And then people live through that differently. But the idea of a quarter life crisis, which I had mine at 33, 34, I don't think maybe I'll live to 120 something, but I still think of it as a quarter life crisis. That is very cultural and generational. And I'm also extremely lucky to have the privilege to have been able to consider 
doing something else, trying it, failing at it, trying again, right? And, you know, even if you feel that disconnect, there are many, I think the vast majority of people do not have the luxury of sitting and going, what else do I want to do? That's, that's very true. That's very true. It's, if you don't have the basic needs taken care of, that's not an existential question that you're going to be asking. That's not going to be high up on your list of priorities. So mm -hmm. switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about leadership and women in leadership and ask right off the bat, why? Why women in leadership? Why is that one of your passions? There are two big reasons. Um, one is because as a psychologist, the vast majority of humans you're going to see walking through your door self-identify as female. It's just for a variety of reasons, including social acceptance, things like that. It's just what happens. So very early on in my career, what I was hearing, what I was talking about were struggles that women were facing, which gave me an insight into it. Being a woman, there's this desire to work as well with women. But the other piece was this huge aha moment. When I decided I wanted to really focus on women, when I was going to not focus on everybody who needed my help, but very specifically focus on women and especially focus on women in the corporate world, I started doing a lot of research. And I made this transition, which is kind of what we want when we talk about allyship, between knowing something and understanding it. So I knew that women get treated differently than men. I knew that gender bias was a thing. I knew that women got paid less, that they had to work harder. All of these things I knew. I knew because I read about it. I talked about it with women about it. They didn't get it. And something in doing the research to be able to position my business for the corporate world of really looking into the data, it hit me. And it was shocking and infuriating. And I'll be honest embarrassing that it hit me and part of the reason it hit me versus realizing it before is because i've nearly always worked for myself i've worked since i was 13. when i was 13 i worked like i had a job where i had 20 hours a week on top of going to school and yes i've worked in small jobs but career-wise i was in business for myself after two years post postdoc right after being licensed so i'm the boss i determine my pay I'm in a power position as a therapist in a room, right? Uh, in hindsight, I can think back to, oh, there's bias, there's bias, there's bias. But I didn't experience the inherent daily bias, the inherent microaggression that takes place for women in the workplace. It was only in doing the research that I was appalled by how similar the stories were. And something switched in me. I love men. <laughs> Married to one, I have two others in my house that I'm trying to raise into being good men. My dad was a great guy, whatever. I don't think that most men walk into the place wanting to set up a system that then makes men and women biased against women. But the fact is that is the system we operate in. And there are too many very, very smart, impactful, driven, ambitious women who, A, are made to feel uh, guilty and wrong for being ambitious, um, who are asked to work or show up twice as effectively, three times as hard in order to get the opportunities and are still expected to carry most of the weight of caretaking outside of the home. That needs to change. And I don't, as much as I'd like to believe that men want to change the system it's very hard to change something that's working for you or something that you've built so you can't see how it's broken so women have to be the ones to lead the change in order for them to have the power they need to rise that's why i do what i do it's heartbreaking that we could have had this conversation sitting in the 50s in the 60s in the 80s in the 90s we're having this conversation in 2022 <laughs> And we'll be having it in 2042. That is insane. But I, I resonate with a lot of things that you said. I have also been fortunate 
throughout my life. I started working in uh, an American company. I was in Procter & Gamble for five years. It was a very Americanized work culture, very much equal, which was rare for a, the country that I was in, which was very conservative, and the general rules were extremely rigid. But in the company, it was like a little bubble. And we definitely felt heard as women. And later on, I was also, like you, my own boss. So, of course, clients might have come in with biases, but at the end of the day, they were hiring me as a director. I was in filmmaking for a while. As a, so they hired me as a director, and then I was the boss of the project. So I was the one hiring the teams, and then it was up to me to set the tone for the whole project. But... I started studying specifically the differences between how men and women communicate at work, because that is what my focus is now on leadership communications. And there are such stark differences in the way that men and women communicate, all the way from how women and men use body language. So for example, and you might know a lot of these, but I'll just kind of quickly oh, go please. over the few things that I, that I learned, and I would love to know your point of view. So women, the difference in body language between women and men, just an, a small example is how women nod to indicate that they're listening, but men nod to indicate that they are in agreement. So women end up nodding a lot more, and perhaps that nodding is perceived as agreement when it's actually just listening and support. In terms of the actual words that are being used, a lot of women will use questioning intonations and this is something i caught myself doing so much do you think we can do this i think we should do this and a man would would use sentences not questions and also a woman is more likely to use we and a man is more likely to use i one of the most eye-opening things about the differences in communication between the genders that i learned was through a tedx talk i believe it was by Reshma Sojani. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's a brilliant one. Oh, and she definitely. said, I'll send you the link. She okay. says that uh, she did this, I don't know if it was her or if she uh, read about it, but there was this experiment in IT students, so because she works in coding. So this experiment with students that work coding and these students were, of course, finding errors in their coding projects and seeking help from their teachers. When a man, when a male student approached a teacher and asked for help, the man would say, hi, can you help me? There's something wrong with my code. When a female student approached the same teacher with an error in her project, she would say, hi, can you help me? There's something wrong with me. I can't figure this out. There's something wrong with me. I cannot tell you how chilling that was. Even now as I'm talking about it, it's sending chills up and down my body because I have said those words so many times. And when I saw that TEDx talk, I realized, wow, do men really say there's something wrong with this project? Do men really not think that every single mistake that they make is a direct reflection of how good they are? How fragile are our own esteems and our own, how fragile is our own self-worth as women? And just that bit of difference in communication style was, it was mind blowing for me. Yeah, I mean, the, all of those things really speak to me. The nodding is really interesting, but with women, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, for one, we do not a lot. And then people assume that because we're nodding, we are in agreement, therefore we don't have anything to say. So we're not invited to speak as much. But I have literally, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was having lots of conversations with people because they couldn't meet them. And so I remember jumping on a conversation with a local CEO of a, uh, it's a tech company, small tech company, well, not that small, but, and we were talking about the work I do and his women. And he literally said, well, could you teach my women to use less words? They use, did you not see the research? Women use five times as many words as men. Da, da, da. I can't even remember what the number is. And I sat there, first of all, in that moment, I'm like, I do not want to work with you. Uh, it was my first thought. But second of all, we do use more words. Why do, on average, women tend to use more words? Because we're asked to explain and justify, right? 
Now, in saying all this, if you're a male listening to this, I don't want you to sit around and go, why are they bashing us? We're not bashing you. What we're saying is there's a discrepancy that exists and it would be really nice if we could operate by the same standards you have not to have you lose your standards, right? So women and actually minoritized individuals in any system have to prove that what they say is factually true. In most systems, if you are in power, and in this case, if we're talking gender, if you're a male, you can walk in and say, this isn't the right way of approaching this. We should do things this way. And in general, more often than not, people will go, okay, well, tell me about it. Whereas if you say that as a woman, what will happen is, well, where are you coming from? Can you, what, what data do you have to back that up? What's going on? That gets internalized over a lifetime. So we tend to walk in as explainers off the bat. And it, and it tends to be expected. This idea also of upspeak, that's what you were talking about when I say, hi, my name is Alessandra. It's really nice to meet you, right? Do you have a moment to speak? Which women use a lot um, and became, and this I don't know why, it became more noticeable again with the millennial generation. And I don't know what that is. Maybe it's just that we're podcasting more and broadcasting more. So we, we were paying attention to it. The problem with upspeak is that the brain interprets upspeak as you're lying. You're making a statement, but you're using a tone and an inflection that's for a question. So you're not sure. So either you're uncertain or you're lying to me. I am now going to start doubting what you're saying. And now we've got a trust breach, right? I can't even listen to you. But we do it. Women in general have learned to do that because when we make very forceful statements, we are told that we are, I had one prospective client today, I was talking to one woman I was talking to who was saying, you know, I don't have a confidence issue. She said, actually, it's problematic. I have been labeled as arrogant and aggressive at times. But it's just because when I walk into a system, if I understand it, I can speak to it. And I just like to get straight to the issue. But if we say, instead of saying, hey, we really need to, I'm looking at the system, it's broken, and, and we, we need to review it, then we're arrogant and aggressive. If I come in and I say, hey, I'm wondering, I was looking at the system, is anybody else seeing a problem with the system? I'm wondering if maybe, possibly, there would be a better way of doing this. I'm thinking that maybe, and this is the stuff we need to do to not get backlash, but it's also the exact same stuff that makes people say we're not decisive, and that then undermines our authority. In body language, there's so many other things like how sitting, right? Women tend to sit and we tend to try to take as little space as possible, often out of consideration in tight spaces. But when you take up little space physically in power and authority circle, you look like you are less important. It's fascinating. The rules just aren't the same. And we have all, all of us at this point, contributed to reinforcing the system, and, and we can all play a part in adapting the system. We don't need to dismantle it. We just need to adapt it to the reality of the world. But some of us are more incentivized to do that than others. So I work with the ones who are most incentivized. That makes a lot of sense. When you're in a minority whatever it is, whether it's based on gender, race, language, you tend to want to explain yourself more. You tend to want to prove yourself. And I've seen this in language learning, for example. Uh, I, I grew up bilingual, so you know I, I, I never had to learn the English language as an adult, but that is not something everyone knows about me when they see me, specifically in the West. And I remember that I went through this weird psychological phase, which I had never experienced before. I grew up speaking in English. I was never conscious of speaking in it. Like I was never self-conscious. But when I went to the US, I was, I, I was in this psychological zone where I was like, I must, I must make sure I use correct grammar. I must make sure like my pronunciation works. I changed my pronunciation and now I can't change it back because we grew up with the British English um, education system. So we were like in the dance camp or the bathroom camp. Uh, but when I had to, when I was in the US, I had to like change it over to, to bathroom and can't and 
to this day, my husband makes fun of me because he was there with me and his accent didn't change. And he still says, can't, can't even say it this way anymore. And he makes fun of me when I say, like, I can't do that. And he's like, can't, you can or you can't. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember that it was just something that happened. I just had to be flexible. I had to fit into that system because I was very aware I was coming in as a woman of color from a developing country, <laughs> had a lot of things not going my way. But I made it work and it was not a hostile environment at all. It was actually really friendly, but at the same time, people come in with their biases to that environment. So to your point, it's not that anyone is trying to be openly hostile or openly aggressive. It's just that the system is built that way with those inherent biases. And yep. we're, so we're talking about, you know, speaking as a leader, that is what I love talking about. That is, you know, my tagline and something I, I live and breathe every day. So would you say that there are fundamental differences in terms of speaking as a leader as to what women and men do? And also, is that also what you advise? For example, do you, are you of that school of thought, which says that yes, women and men should absolutely be speaking differently as leaders or not? So one of the things women tend to do is say, I think, when it's a statement. And I just want you to know that if I say, I think, in the most cases, if it's it's really because I think, and if I slip into the other ones, I'll catch myself incorrect. Um, so this is, I think, I believe. I believe we approach leadership differently. I don't believe that's a universal rule, right? There are some women who, if we pretend that the world exists on a masculine, feminine spectrum, I think there are some women who lead more with more mas masculine, typical masculine traits. And there are men who lead with more typical feminine traits. Actually, what we know in leadership right now is that the traits that are most sought after in leaders and male leaders tend to align with EQ. And these are traits that have been uh, documented in female leaders for years. So now companies are spending a fortune to try to teach men to lead with these more feminine, feminine traits. They don't call it that way, right? Because then nobody would want to learn them. Um, and although women have been leading with these characteristics for a very long time, they're not getting the bonus from leading this way. We just know that these are really effective. And so we're training men to lead this way. So we know that men and women lead differently. I really fundamentally believe that there is a place for both styles of leadership. And so that's why when we start creating systems, organizations, companies, communities, governments, where we have a better representation of that diversity, then we'll have leadership that is more agile. Right? When it comes to speech itself, how we speak, I'm really curious how much of the way we speak as women globally, and I will say it's globally, I have worked with women and spoken to women on every single continent, and every single one of them at some point says, well, you know, in my culture, and here's the thing, they all repeat the same thing. Well, you know, in my culture, women aren't supposed to brag. So there's a spectrum on that, right? If I speak to somebody um, from Pakistan or from India, or if I speak to somebody who's grown up in Indonesia, that means something a little different than if I speak to somebody who was born and raised in California. But the idea is still the same, that women aren't supposed to brag, right? They're not supposed to talk about themselves. And then there's a continuum. There are things that I think American women don't perceive as bragging that if I spoke to somebody from Indonesia, they'd be like, oh my goodness, like that is very brash and that is very out there and that is very self, self-serving in, in your language. I'd be really interested in seeing and understanding how much of some of our communication patterns as leaders as and as female leaders is socialized versus ingrained. We do tend, I'm dealing in stereotypes here, to be more collaborative and more group oriented. So we do tend to use we a lot. But here's the problem. Research sh shows that when women don't say we, we are perceived negatively by men and women. So what is it? Is it that we naturally speak as a collective because we think collectively? Or is it that we were raised to speak that way and so that gets reinforced and perpetuated? I don't know. I know that in speech language, when I'm working with the women I'm working with, my first rule, so the women I work with, again, are in senior leadership and executive leadership. 
And I'm usually working with women for one of two reasons. One, they are, they've been working very, very hard. They want to show up. These women want to play impactful, influential roles in, in the future of their companies or their industries. So they've been working very hard. They should be higher. They should be paid more. They should have more influence than they have. And they're trying to figure out how to build that out. Or they're in the roles they deserve to be in and they belong in. They just want to make sure they show up as impactfully and as confidently and as powerfully as they can. But the first rule, no matter what is, first and foremost, you have to show up as yourself. Right? We cannot play rules. It does not work for women to walk into a system and try to behave like men. And it does not work for us to try to play the role of like the hyper feminine woman. So how, wherever you are on that spectrum, you have to show up as yourself. And there are certain things that we do that really rob us of our authority and speech that we absolutely have to change. So up speak is one of them. Saying I think is one of them. We use hedging language like I think to try to ease in our ideas. There is a better way. I teach women. I say, if you really don't know, say I believe. If you're introducing something and you don't want to sound too forceful, you can use words like, you know, based on the information I have. My hypothesis would be, right, which is still a little less forceful than this doesn't make any sense. We shouldn't do this. Like, based on, you know, I've been looking at the data and based on the information I have, something is off here. My hypothesis is that it's these things. I believe we should approach it differently, right? I were using this process. It's still more words than men. It's still more hedging, but it's way more powerful than, you know, I'm wondering if maybe like, I think maybe there's a problem with the system here. And well, I mean, it's just an idea, but maybe we could try, what do you guys think? I've just given up all my authority. Who is going to listen to me? Who's going to trust me when really powerful leadership is needed? If there's not part of me that's showing up with certainty and strength in these daily conversations. There's so much, so many layers to, to what you've said. It's, it's fascinating, the vocabulary that we need to unlearn when we get to leadership positions as women, the kind of things that we need to learn to say, and the slightly more masculine traits that we need to at least understand and then figure out for ourselves whether or not they fit in with our personality. And that's something I, I completely agree with because a lot of women, I guess this was kind of the thing in the 80s and 90s, a lot of women started dressing as men. And it was one of those unspoken rules that women shouldn't be overly feminine. And I never understood that. And I watched that as I was growing up. And for me, I, I like being feminine. I like, you know, wearing my big earrings and sometimes my dresses and getting my nails done. And it led me to, to try to figure out, like, does this undermine my authority as a woman? So there are all these cues that are built in and learned and ingrained in our thought processes as women and men, I believe. And I love this distinction between I think and I believe. This is something I don't think I did very consciously, that I have been doing very consciously, but I will try my best to, to take that into, you know, into account. Am I overusing I think? But you raised a really interesting point about inclusivity because all leadership styles aren't authoritative. All leadership styles aren't, I am the authority here and I'm gonna make, I'm gonna have the final say. A lot of leaders are very inclusive. They do want to know what their teams think. And I can see a divide here where a man asking that question would not be undermining his authority necessarily, but a woman asking that question might be. And how, I don't even understand how a woman would navigate that situation if she doesn't want to be that kind of leader who has all the answers all the time. And here's the thing, she's, first of all, we are expected to ask those questions. So a woman who doesn't ask those questions, unless she's really well established her brand in different ways or really well established that, that trust in her competency and her warmth and all of those things, if she doesn't ask those questions, she'll be penalized for it. If she does 
ask them, she'll be penalized for it. And it's just the way the system is, right? I am a firm believer that um, you got to work with what you've got. So one of the things I don't do is work with women and say, screw this, it shouldn't be the way it is. You go in, you do X. First of all, that doesn't make sense. I'm not telling you what you should do. Second of all, it's suicide. It is career suicide to walk in and tell a woman, um, you know, all your emails, I want you to take off all your padding language. Right? Although they really should, quote unquote, a woman's email will be something like, hey, Jim, I hope you had a wonderful weekend. I was wondering, did you have a chance to look at this project? Because we have a meeting about it later on today, and it would be really useful to have the update on the agenda before then. Do you think maybe you could provide that? Hope you have a great rest of your day. If Alexander, instead of Alessandra, is sending that email, he goes, hey, Jim, did you did you get the, have you created the updated agenda for this meeting? We need it beforehand. Get it to me when you can. And, you know, some kind of salutation. And it would be nice if we didn't need to put so much language. We would, Jim would probably prefer a shorter email. I would certainly prefer sending a less wordy email, but I would be labeled, right? I would get really, really negative labeling. So you, we can't go in and say, don't do what's been expected because even the most self-aware gender egalitarian human beings react consciously and unconsciously to that. So we need to slowly decide what works for us and what doesn't work for us. And we need to build support and then create enough representation in the system so that we can change the way things are done. And that is, that is really tough, right? It starts with us. Control free care. I know what I can control. I can't control anybody else. So I'm going to make it me. And if I'm working with you, I'm going to make it you. And then everything is about being mindful of human psychology. Okay, I think that is really important. If you're listening to this and you're like, I don't like the way things are. I'm like, you cannot go in and change things just like that. You have to be mindful of human psychology. And, and if you want to create real change, we have to be disruptive without being destructive. Mm. right like when you come in and you try to take down and destroy some a system somebody is functioning in completely that's really scary and what you're going to get is you're going to get a fight whereas you could have had an ally with just the right kind of disruption so you know there's some people who don't agree with me and we would never work together and that's fine um there's some people who don't want to disrupt the system and we would never agree and they wouldn't work with me i wouldn't want to work with them at least and that's fine and then, like, for me, especially leveraging what I know psychologically, that is the best approach to creating change. Bridge gaps, bring people together, get people to understand, and then together make the change happen. It's slower, it's painful, it's not fair. It works. And hopefully it'll last for longer, that kind of systemic change. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. It reminded me of the the Maya concept that a lot of people talk about. Uh, the that when you want to introduce something new and innovative, um, work on introducing it through the Maya concept, the most advanced yet acceptable way, because people are looking for innovation. They are looking to change, but not that much, not drastically, and not overnight. They don't. That's that's going to be jarring for them. Like you said that difference between disruption and destruction that's beautiful and it really works for a lot of people i'm probably a little bit of an offlier uh an outlier in that because i feel that i love huge change and systemic change and overnight change and i've done that for myself many times in life i but in general this makes sense for a lot of people specifically when you're talking about organizations as a whole because you have to kind of look at the lowest common denominator in a lot of those cases. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, you just brought up something and I, don't, I have to ponder this, but if you're listening and you, you hear this and you ponder through it, if you can just email me what you think your answer is, 
um, or email you with it you think the answer is right when when you talk about the concept of grief grief is the emotion you experience when you face loss we most often talk about grief grief in the concept of loss of life but grief exists for all kinds of things like a marriage that's a marriage that's ending a relationship that's ending we experience grief when you have an ideal and that ideal gets robbed. Suddenly you, that ideal is no longer possible. You experience grief and you have these stages, right? The first stage of grief is denial. And mm-hmm. then there's bargaining. And then there's there's anger. And then there's depression. Think of it as deep sorrow. And then acceptance. I love doing it this way. It's like watching a telenovela. I'm right by the Spanish border. So it's think of a think of your afternoon soap opera show and the uh, the main male character dies. He'll show up in three episodes. He'll come back alive some way. But right now he's dead. And so the female protagonist runs up to him and she, and first of all, she starts, she goes, no, 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 denial. And then she goes, dear God, please, if you just bring him back, I promise. Bargaining. And then, damn you, damn it. No. Anger. Then she weeps, depression, and eventually she goes and finds the next guy. Right? So Bob Rowe. So those are your stages of grief. And I'm, and I'm thinking when you disrupt a system and you remove from people what they were used to, I'd have to really think through this, whether part of what you're triggering is some kind of grief. So initially there's like, no, this isn't an issue. It's not happening. Then there's like, well, let's see, maybe we can do a little bit of this, but not too much. You're bargaining. I'll let some of this in, but not all of it. And then maybe things will be okay. But if you push too hard, too fast, no matter what, at some point in time, you're going to face some kind of anger. The anger can come out really violently or it can come out just in this more subdued frustration. And then there's going to be a moment of sadness of like, why can't things just be the way they used to be? Like, it was more simple before. This was easy. Like before the Me Too movement, I could just like sit in a room with people and I'd be fine. Now I have to be all afraid. Right? Mm. The goal is to ease people through to that acceptance of like, I guess this is the way things are, and it's not so bad. Like, I can make this work. Right? When you push too hard, I think we move people into that anger stage, and they stay in there way longer than they need to, and that it halts the progress and the evolution that we're, that we're seeking to create. Yeah. But I don't know. If you're listening to this and you're like, no, I don't think that makes sense, or you're like, I actually make sense, and I have, like, the scientific explanation for why this this is true – would love for you to contact us yes i think there's more to build on on that yeah that's 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 a fascinating explanation of the process and i think we definitely got stuck in the anger stage way too long when it comes to just feminism in general just the fact that the word feminism or feminist has become one of those things that people get enraged about is ridiculous to me the fact that when i say i'm a feminist it it will it's trigger triggering. people. It's insane. All I'm saying is I think women should have the same rights. What? So this is yeah one of those things that really upsets me because I, I don't understand how feminism just managed to, to anger so many people for so long and it continues to do that. Um, I, I really want to switch gears for a short while and go into public speaking because you are also an international public speaker and i would love to know more about that journey was it difficult for you to start or were you a natural and how has your speaking journey been so far okay for better for worse i'm probably a natural meaning uh i love public speaking <laughs> i mean i love it i love i get i get nervous everybody gets nervous if you talk to anybody I mean, even talk to a really well-known artist, they'll tell you before they walk onto the stage, they're nervous. So it's not that I don't get nervous, but once I'm on stage or once I'm in front of an audience, I love it. Um, The skill itself is very learned, right? So the first time I did it, I was doing it as an academic. Those were boring. If you're an academic listening to this, please consider your audience. You can be scientifically rigorous, informative, and interesting. The TED Talks have shown us that. Um, but <clears throat> so initially was probably very boring and not very good. I like to think I'm better now. Uh, it was a strange journey. The first time I pitched myself to speak, talking about bias, 
I was completely dismissed by the powers that be, but eventually their, uh, their support staff brought me up and, and got to go speak. Uh, I, you know, if you're looking at speaking, one of the things to consider is know what your topics are, do your research. I never pre-write a speech ever. I have an outline of what I want to talk about. I know what points I want the audience to leave talking about, and I will practice working through that outline and making those points so much so that if there's any issue on stage, I can just roll with it. And that's really the key is to just remember you're having this like conversation with people. That's all it is. You know something, they're probably interested in it if they've invited you to speak on the topic. And if you're clear about what you want them to leave knowing, in general, it's fine. In general. Mm -hmm. Alessandra, I think we're the same person. Just I like that. Oceans apart. I love it. <laughs> so much of what you said resonated with me. I've also always been for lack of a better word, natural when it comes to public speaking, because I've just loved it so much. I don't think I've always been good at it, but I've always loved it. And then of course I've had to, to practice the craft over time and develop it over time. And the, the thing that you said about not writing it out, but practicing it, it rings so true because you often see two camps when it comes to public speakers or actually uh, more specifically people that want to be public speakers they're not very experienced yet so a lot of my clients would either fall into the camp of wanting to write out every single thing that they want to say and then they're stuck because they can't memorize all those things and they shouldn't be unless they're you know again giving a TED talk which is a totally different thing or they think that they're just gonna wing it oh, I'm good when I'm improvising. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk off these slides. And they think they're doing a good job, but actually they're using filler words. They're reading off the slides. They're not coming across as, as confidently as they would have if they had just done the practice and the rehearsal. So writing those bullet points so you're not making yourself attached to an entire written out script, but then rehearsing it so that when you finally get to that stage, you can be comfortable. You can feel like you got this and not constantly worry about what you're going to say next or whether you're going to have the right words to explain things. And the second point that you raised actually a little earlier about jargon, it's again something that you see across different industries. You talked about the medical field, but it's equally true in tech. It's equally true, no matter you know which industry you come from, that a lot of the leaders are so used to using that jargon in their everyday lives with their own teams that they forget that when they have to go on a public stage, they need to be able to develop the capability to explain complex things in simple ways. That's what's gonna make them shine on that stage. But that is something that needs a lot of work. So people that just kind of revert to using these these technical terms and not bothering to explain them are kind of shooting themselves in the foot on that stage. I think, and you probably know more about this than I do, but when you when you look at people, you see this in people who design courses and, and I've gotten better and I do a lot of training online and so I'm better at it. But you, as a speaker, as a trainer, you want to deliver. You want your people leaving feeling, yeah, they got something out of this. So the tendency is to create these presentations or these courses or these trainings that have too much content. They're too complex. Mm -hmm. So then when you show up to present and time never works the way you think it's going to work, you're suddenly pressured to just spout out information instead of connecting with your audience. The other thing is most people are coming in and they're experts in certain fields. And because they have expertise, they minimize the value of what they're presenting, right? They think everybody knows this, so I have to add more. When really going back to the basic, the basics is usually really important. So I've learned over the years to prepare something and then usually, especially if I get to present it a couple times, I'll simplify, like I'll take out more and more and more and more. Listening to audience feedback about what they got 
But if you know what the first, you know, what are the big three, the three tech takeaways, and I always talk about emotion. I do this when we talk about branding with the women I work with. And then when I'm presenting, I'm like, somebody speaks to somebody in my audience later and says, so what was she talking about? What are the three things I want them to say? And then what is the emotion with which do I want them to like be calm and reassured? Do I want them to be excited? Do I want them to feel joy? Because that also determines how you speak and how you enter a space, um, how you dress, right? How like all of those things come into play. Emotion is one of those things that's actually kind of leading us full circle uh, in this conversation because emotion is something that I've always struggled with. And that's where I really feel like I'm not very feminine, quote unquote, because it's always been quite hard for me to express emotion in everyday life, in my professional life and on stage to, to an extent. I can be very bold. I can talk about things from a point of, from a place of no fear. But when it comes to really getting emotion out of people, and this was very evident in my writing, when I started being more um, active online, I realized that a lot of people could actually infuse their writing with emotion a lot more easily than me. And ironically, I, I got a coach and he helps me sometimes craft some of my stories. And this is this is a male. And when he give like edits my stories sometimes he inserts emotion and i'm like wow you know you're you're writing in a more feminine way and it's insane i i realize that that is probably there's probably something to do with my childhood there in some way if i go deeper but emotion is one of those big things and i think now we're realizing more and more that if you can reach people by invoking some kind of emotion then you're really creating long lasting impact, whether you're doing it online, whether you're doing it in person or in the business environment, people remember how they feel and people remember how you made them feel. It's one of those things that we kind of learn and come across when we're younger and we discard it thinking that's not very important. Who cares about emotion? But that's really what it's all about. The limbic system in the brain was formed before the prefrontal cortex, like that reason, emotion came long before reasoning. And so we still relate to that. And we're, you know, at the end of the day, we're social animals. Mm. We're social animals. So it's one of the things I heard about two things in what you do and also the support you're getting is it is essential to get the right kind of support. It is a mistake to believe that we should be able to figure things out entirely on our own, that we know it all our own, or even to think that because the information is out there and it's all out there, none of us out here are teaching anything really fundamentally new, that it makes sense for you to invest all of your time in acquiring that information, synthesizing it, applying it to yourself, and then, and then expressing it. <clears throat> so... You have a coach because you realize you've got a lot of things to say, but there's somebody out there who might be a slightly better writer. And so they're going to help you coach you through writing. And eventually you will integrate all that knowledge and become a better writer. People come to you when they want to be able to speak more impactfully, you know, when they want to have greater presence, when they want to up their influence, which is what we need to affect change, right? If you don't have influence in your organization, you cannot affect change. And so part of that influence is in having daily conversations with people and knowing how to show up. People often think about public speaking simply in terms of speeches and presentations and TED Talks and panels. There's a lot of public speaking um, cues and knowledge that can actually go into how do you sit while waiting in a room while waiting for a meeting to start and talk with people, right? Where's the comfort in knowing how to manage a room where you feel uncomfortable? You say we're very similar. I will share this and then I know we're kind of at time, but I'm an introvert. Most people don't know this because I love public speaking. Introversion and social anxiety are not the same thing. After being at a conference or after public speaking, I literally need to isolate. I spend a lot of time completely alone. This is my home office that I'm in right now on Sunday because I didn't have any social obligations. I spent most of my day in that chair there reading. And the rest of my family was like, well, every time we came back upstairs, you were in, you were in your room, right? 
So for those of you who are listening, who are more introverted or who, whether you're introverted or extroverted or experiencing any kind of social anxiety, hiring a coach to help you work through how to speak publicly can really provide you skills that you can transfer into your day-to-day engagement so that you're not just preparing for a big speech, you're just preparing for the conversations that will move your career and your life forward. Wow, no, thank you. Did not pay me to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say, thank you so much for that that plug. I would not have been able to put that uh, better <laughs> than you did. Thank I, you. I have a coach. I've hired many coaches throughout the years, and I'm so grateful they've accelerated things I could have done on my own. They've propelled me, and that is the job of a coach. It's to get you the places where you want to go faster, sooner, better, and more effectively. So, you know, if you can help that with public speaking, it is absolutely an essential skill for anybody who wants to be in leadership to know how to carry yourself and how to speak publicly. It's essential. Thanks. And I completely agree that public speaking is not the end goal. I always tell my clients that it's a tool. It's a tool that you're using to build your own confidence. It's a tool that you're using to refine your overall communication skills. If you can explain something and be understood to an audience of 100, then you can really be understood with an audience of 10 or 2. And once you get on that stage. In fact, each time that you get on that stage, you're building your own self-worth. You're telling yourself, I did that. That was a scary thing. And I did that and I rocked it and people loved me. And that really, really helps with your overall confidence, specifically when you need to be speaking out in meetings, when you need to be heard in the office. So absolutely, I I agree. You you hit the nail on the head. You hit all the nails on the head. With, with that. So that was a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Alessandra, for taking the time to talk to us. And I think that this was an amazing conversation because we covered so much and there's so many layers to what you said and how you explain things. I can think of a hundred different questions that I would love to, to ask you and keep talking with you about. So if anyone has questions for Dr. Wall, please let us know. Let me know. I have my email in the podcast description and I would love to to forward them to Alessandra and she can get back to you because I think there's a lot of things to unpack really in that conversation. So thank you so much again for taking the time. You're welcome. It is my pleasure. And I will say if somebody wants to speak to me directly, you can find me on LinkedIn, one L two S's. I think this only matters in America. The rest of the world can spell Alessandra properly. Um, It was... It was for, I know it's the beginning of your day. It's the end of mine. It was a wonderful way of closing the day. Thank you.